Hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome to D5 Rendering Course for Beginners. In this course, I will try to guide you through the whole, the whole process from start to finish in creating architectural visualization with D5. And not just that, we'll also touch upon animations, creating animations, and maybe a little bit of some more bonus content that you will see if you follow this video. So I will be using this model right here that you see on the screen and this is done in Rhino but it's not necessary for you to have also a model that's done in Rhino you can use any software you want to create your architectural model the for those of you who are using Rhino well first of all uh, this model if you want to follow along completely closely in the video description you will see a patreon link and people who support the channel on patreon get all of these models as well as the final models after the course for free so consider supporting the channel if you want this model but enough about that in case uh, that you are not using rhino you can skip ahead to the importing step but for those of you who are using rhino i just want to point out one thing little thing it's the layers so when you're before exporting into d5 you want your different materials or elements that have different materials to be in different layers and the reason for that is because we will use an out automated uh, tool that's called synchronize render colors that will create a material for each layer that we have right so roof planks will get its own uh, its own material ceiling will get its own material and so on when you're creating a bunch of materials for different types of geometries that you have that usually share the same material you're basically going to carry over those materials into D5 and thus making your life a little bit easier with switching between uh, between them, right? So let's say all of the green boys right here arrive into D5 as one single object. Then all you need to do is just switch the material of the green ones with glass and then you will have your glass material there, right? Hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, just bear with me for a second. Once we actually get geometry in uh, D5, it's going to make more sense. So for now, I will just run synchronize render colors, hit enter, select objects. I will just select all layers right here, hit enter, 94 layers synchronized. And you can see a bunch of materials have been created. That's great. That's exactly what I want. Then uh, once this is done, I basically can uh, start importing it into Rhino, uh, into D5, what am I saying? So the importing process is pretty straightforward. Uh, when you start the D5 render launcher, you are presented with this kind of a menu here, where you can create a new, uh, new file or open up an existing file. You can ch check out your recent files and open up those or describe a workflow or explore. Usually you just work with the top three objects here, right? Or tools here. There's also some demo scenes to download if you want to check out how professionals set up their scenes. But I would suggest for now, let's just go for the new file here. Click on that. It loads for a second and uh, afterwards it just opens up this menu. So this menu, let me yoink myself in here and maybe make myself a little bit smaller. Um, this viewport that you see here is like the default uh, D5 viewport where I will kind of cover all of the everything that you see here. But before I do that, we want to import our geometry just so that it's a little bit a little bit nicer uh, so so that we have something to look at right so back in rhino uh, i will synchronize my uh, view right sorry that is the wrong plugin there we go d5 that's the plugin <laughs> d5 connect to d5 
there we go i will connect it to d5 so click on that by the way if you don't have this plugin just uh, make sure that you that you download d5 link to you uh, Rhino, it's a free free add-on, right? So we convert it. It says D5 converter success. Then we open up our uh, D5 uh, model, and there it is. As easy as that. It's literally a single click, and now your like these two uh, modes or, or these two software packages are indeed linked right so you can see that it's nothing to write home about it doesn't look that great and naturally of course it it shouldn't look that great because there's so many settings that are um, still not applied so with this done let me just finish up by saying that you can uh, synchronize live updates uh, so you can every time you change something for instance i take the roof and gumball on move the roof roof up uh, this is not even the roof this is just the cladding of the roof i move it up if i look at at it here it hasn't changed right so i would need to click on the synchronize button synchronizes then i wait a little bit come on it's loading so it reloads the whole model right and yeah there we go it reloads the whole model and now it's updated so let me just undo that, synchronize again, and it should be fine, All right? Then we have synchronize or uh, enable camera position update. So if I have this uh, enabled, then if I turn my camera in Rhino, let me show you. Let me just make this a little bit bigger. There we go. If I turn my camera in Rhino, it's synchronized with the camera in D5, which is pretty nice. So, so you can name your views in Rhino, create a bunch of views and transfer them to D5. That's not what we're going to be doing, but it's just a nice to have. Also, you have synchronized scene lists. So if you have named views, a bunch of named views, those will insert, be inserted here as scenes. I'll talk about those in just a second. And then you have synchronized lights. No, we will be creating lights by ourselves in, uh, in D5. So for now, we don't really need Rhino anymore. You can either close it or minimize it up to you. With your model in place, right? If your model in place, I can show you like the main uh, tips and tricks about the, the, the scene that you're looking at. So the first thing is the viewport, of course right the navigation of the viewport so this is your only screen unfortunately at least to my knowledge there you can't have more than one uh, viewport right now so you you will be working in a single view all the time here if i uh, select the top left most top left option or tool on the screen i can see move and rotate or scale so let's say i select this object right here i should be able to either scale it or move and rotate it for some reason i cannot oh yeah and that that is because my base model is locked right so here you can see sorry that i'm jumping around it's just because i want to show you the movement and here with this one i can't so base model right here it is locked so i am unable to neither move nor rotate it right so i need to unlock it here bam now it's unlocked and now as i select it you'll you see that i can move it you can also see that it's uh, imported and it stays imported as a single piece of geometry that has multiple materials but it is a single uh single piece right that's that's an important uh, important thing to note it's a single object right you can hide it or preview it but it stays single so that's uh, moving or rotating that is scaling is literally the same thing you can scale your object as much as as much as you want right typically since we are importing these oops 
there we go. Uh, since we are importing this from Rhino, you shouldn't need to neither scale nor move or rotate your object. There we go. So that with that being done, now we have another uh, setting here, which is the movement uh, axes, basically. Are you following the world XYZ axis or are you following the local XYZ axis? What I mean, uh, what we mean by that is, if I take this object and I rotate it uh, 45 degrees or whatever, some some amount. Now with this uh, local movement being set, you can see that the Z, X, and Y also have rotated 45 degrees. So I'm I'm still moving the object according to its local values, right? But if I change this to global, right here, I clicked here. If I change it to global, now I can see my that my Z is my world Z and my X is world X and my Y is world Y, right? So here you're changing between the uh, UVW or XYZ coordinate system, right? Let's not have it rotated in a very weird way. Typically, I keep this at uh, the global uh, or XYZ coordinate system all the time. Next one is the material picker. So if I select the material picker here and I, let's say, click on the roof, then on the right hand side, you can see that my material that is picked is currently being displayed. That is quite useful, and I will talk about it much more in just a second once we get to the material uh, options. But before we do that, I want to kind of finish up with the, with the viewport. So for now, just know that Material Picker enables you to pick any material that you want, right? That you have on the scene and edit it, it of course. On the right hand side, we have the camera settings and the camera settings are basically as, as follows. So we have the exposure. If auto exposure is turned off, then your exposure control is controlled through the EV values like that. And, and it will never adjust. It will never change no matter what kind of environment the camera is in. If the exposure auto exposure is turned on, then it's going to always change according to the EV, uh, not EV, sorry, according to uh, exposure value, uh, according to how bright or how dark the uh, average pixel on the screen is. I think it uses a histogram, but doesn't matter. It's uh, still the same thing. It's automatically exposing, right? And you can still make it brighter or darker. Oh, never mind, you can't, because if you start messing around with this, the auto exposure turns off. So let me go back to zero, enable auto exposure. We'll deal with this much, much later. One of my favorite things with the, with the camera settings here is the, uh, there we go is the field of view, right? The field of view is awesome. So we can change the field of view like that, or a much, for, for me at least, a much better way is changing the camera uh, lens length, which is the second, or focal length, which is the second number right here. So for instance, the camera that I have right here, bam, uh, the focal length right now, not not the prettiest boy but it is what it is right now we're at 55 millimeters for the focal length and if i do this we're at 18 millimeters so if i were to change this back to uh here to 55 this is basically the same camera or same lens that my camera is using if I go in here and change this to 18, that is also, like my, my lens can adjust. So uh, this is the most zoomed out lens, the position of the lens that it is. 
right so uh typically we are uh, a human eye the focus of the human eye is very very tricky because we tend to blur things at, on on which we don't focus but rule of thumb is like 45 degrees of 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 an angle 40 so here with 50 millimeters we get uh, 39.6 uh, degrees of of the focal uh area i guess uh, which is quite natural for us, so we will stick to that. Depth of field, much later, but basically the, with depth of field, the closer things are, uh, the more out of focus they're going to be. For now, let's have it turned off. We will come back to this much later. In the Below, you'll see like the camera... Uh, how is it called? portion of the video camera control portion of the video and then you can change the view from a perspective to top to front to left and so on right pretty straightforward pretty self-explanatory the only thing that i probably should uh, discuss is the perspective right so here we have perspective versus two-point perspective uh, with perspective, you ha you can create a vanishing point. Let me actually make this very, very aggressive. One second. I'll, I need to lock my model so that I don't mess it up. And let's make this like 12. And zoom, 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 zoom. As I zoom in, you can see if my camera is looking downwards or upwards, a third... A vanishing point is created right that goes down right so all of these lines here they meet up at a vanishing point like a third vanishing point that usually is not that great for like cinematic looks uh, typically you, you don't want it so uh, a tool that fixes it is called two-point perspective if I tick this tool you can see that vertical lines are forced to be vertical it still will look weird because we're using a freaking 12 millimeter lens that's a heavily fish eye lens but you know it's it's better it's better so for now i'll keep it as perspective a uh, regular perspective and back to 50 millimeters uh, just for the sake of it all right with this done um, I, I would like to, b before we move on to the display settings here, I will want to jump ahead and here, instead of orbiting, I want to change this to fly mode. So fly mode, like so. And now, uh, the, the, the way you navigate through the viewport is as if you're in a video game. W to move forward, S to move, move backward, A left side d right side wasd movement right q to move up e to move down q e so six buttons very very convenient once you get the hang of it super fast you turn your uh, your screen with the or your head i guess with the mouse uh, right clicking the mouse you right click and drag and this you're you're, you're turning the the, the screen right uh, if you want to go faster you can by just changing the flying uh what's that eye level never mind by changing the flying height uh or by changing the flying speed so that's the speed if i change this to 18 i'm going faster right if i change this to 50 I'm going real fast. Whoa, for interiors, that's very bad. Right, so you change your speed here. The eye level is basically how high you are. So if I go very low, the eye level changes. If I go to zero, that's, that's my zero. I actually need to take this and move it. Let me unlock and just move the whole damn thing a little bit lower just so that we're on the same page with the with the house uh, so you want your house height to be at zero okay with this done uh the last one is the tilt uh you don't mess with this you can see what it does so don't please don't please don't zero zero degrees for the tilt 
for those of you who want uh, Orbit navigation that is much closer to any CAD software, I personally think that uh, the WASD controls are superior when you're dealing with uh, like rendering and not drawing so, uh, or modeling. So I will be using WASD controls. Now under display, there are um, these settings. You have the light sources, so you can either show or enable the preview of the light sources or disable the preview. Currently we have none, so this doesn't matter. Then you have assets, so if you have any rocks and grass and trees and so on, you can hide them by disabling them. I will show that, of course, later. Uh, you have paths, so if you want cars to go along a certain route, you draw a path and you can hide those paths here. And last one, I guess, oh, that's a grid. I thought that's going to be particle systems, but it's a grid. Particle systems are apparently a part of, um, one second. Particle systems are a part of assets, the asset library. So for the grid, that is just for framing. If you want to frame like your, your model in a nice way. So that, that comes much, much later. Rule of thirds, rule of thirds. Bam. Something like that. Um, disable the grid. Then you have modes. Uh, first mode is lit, which is literally just showing the a, a render preview, basically. Right? So everything is calculated. Second one is wireframe, shows you the mesh that is currently being used. Third one is the clay model. Uh, for some reason, the clay model is very, very uh, shiny. I don't remember it being that shiny, but hey, it is what it is. That's fine. There's also a seam here. I'll need to investigate that, but that's later. Or just hide it with a rock. <laughs> but uh, so the clay model is used to just determine if your scene is... To, to cleanly display the objects in your scene without any unnecessary materials. Yeah, that's the way. And then you have last one, real time, right? So real time is basically, let's go back to lit. If you, real time is turned on, uh, then the clouds, as you can see, move slowly. There we go and like the if the rain falls the rain falls and so on so there, there's a bunch of settings uh, or, or trees will sway in the wind and so on so real time is quite uh quite nice to have but sometimes you don't you don't need it especially if you're working on still images so you can have this turned off preview quality you can have either precise or smooth smooth is literally well, you can see no shadows, no nothing, but also it's very fast. So if you're working on a, a weak computer, then you don't need the precise. You can just have it smooth. Okay, Whew. that's it. That's the viewport. That was longer than needed, <laughs> but, but we're done with this. Then here um, you have your layers. Let's, let's talk about the layers. So typically you want to construct your construct your scene in a way where you can hide or unhide different layers right so this is the default layer and your model lives in it uh, you want to create a new one and I'll just call it like oh right click on it rename and just call it uh, trees. And once I start creating trees, and let, let's make this one my active layer for now, but once I start creating trees, those will be placed in this layer. And then if I need to hide the trees, I'll just hide that layer. As easy as that. So it works like literally any program except Revit. <laughs> okay. Except Revit. Uh, it works in layers. Think AutoCAD uh, or Rhino. Uh, so we have layers here as well. Then we have objects that exist in the scene. Currently, it's only the base model. If I right click on the base model, uh, 
I have a bunch of things that I can change with it, but honestly, there's nothing here that... <sighs> there's nothing here that I need to do right now, and most of these settings are self-explanatory, so I will not... Uh, I will not talk about them as much. Maybe later. Whew. Then we have the environment, which is basically our sky uh, settings. So if, if nothing is selected, I'm sorry, uh, one, one thing. If nothing is selected, right? So just click on the sky. If nothing is selected, that, then you access your environment settings on the right hand side right and there's like two tabs here one is called environment and the other one is called effect the environment tab uh, asks you for how do you want to light your scene you can either use geometry uh, geo and sky uh, so you can either use a direct light like a literal point of light for the sun and then a sky, a generated sky map that you that you see here, which I think at this point the it's pretty good. It's it's pretty convincing, and you can uh, change all of these settings to make it nice, or you can use an HDRI map to make it nice. So here we have an HDRI of an early morning, and you can just switch between them. So evening glow. One second, it's loading. There we go. That's evening glow HDRI. Personally, personally, I prefer to use geometry and, and, and sky. So this this method, and here just finding the ni uh, ni the nicest possible angle, messing around with the north offset until it looks great, and then messing around with the clouds and so on until they. So this is how high the sun is in the sky. You can of course do the day, the night time as well. And once the height is set, let's make it like that. Once the height is set, then you mess around with the north offset until you like it. There's also an option here if you press the th three dots to have it uh, with the longitude and latitude uh, quite accurate, right? If you want your uh, sunlight to be softer, you can increase the sun disk radius. And that is something that I usually honestly do, even though it's maybe not that accurate uh, or not that true to life. But I like to increase my uh, disk radius to 20. Okay, it doesn't let me do 20 anymore. <laughs> so I'll do 10. It, it just softens the light quite a bit. Or was it 2 for D5? Maybe it was 2. Eh, let's be safe. Let's do 2. You can see that the light right here, the shadow, became just slightly, slightly softer. It's nice. I like it. With that done, we can contract this again, minimize it, and then talk about clouds. So the weather settings here constitute of clouds, fog, wind, and precipitation precipitation Pre precipitation yeah I, I got it the first time uh, so for the clouds of uh, a lot of sliders here are self-explanatory you can increase the cloud coverage or decrease it up to you uh, I like to have it a little bit increased you have the thickness of the cloud so how high do they go the density how dark do they get or how dense, I guess. The height, how high are they, right? And the speed, how fast do they go? Well, with the speed, you don't really see them now. Let me go back to my display and turn on that real-time uh, setting that I've turned off. And now they go real fast because the speed is, you know, blasting. Let's not have them play. So speed... I can either have speed zero here, or I can go back to camera. Nope, that's not camera, that's under display, and turn off the real-time playback. And then you have cast shadow option, which basically makes the clouds cast shadow on the floor, or on, on the ground. Uh, one thing to test is if we press play, you can see that as clouds are, let's increase the amount of clouds a little bit. 
you can see that the clouds as they're going through the ground they are sometimes uh casting shadows sometimes letting light through let's there we go so one yeah there we go now it's darker now it's brighter again very nice very dynamic so cast shadow i typically have it uh, on if i'm making animations if i'm not making animations it depends most of the time i have it off uh, let me stop the animation there okay so that's the clouds for the uh, fog if i enable the fog you can see here that i can increase the intensity of the fog here uh, let's check yes it increases until the maximum of five which is fine and of course i can change the color of the fog i can make it red or white uh, my suggestion would be always start with white always and then adjust it accordingly then we have the height of the fog so we can go really high up so it's it's much more of a smog type of situation or we can go very very low so that is just covering the bottom uh, of, of the ground right then the fall off basically how strong the gradient of the fog is how fast does it taper the density of the fog tapers as it's going upwards and the star distance basically at, at which height does it start right volume light means that the fog as it uh, sorry the light as it's traveling through the fog will be bounced around inside of the fog this is an actual thing that happens and something that you should uh, incorporate in your renders so once that is turned on scattering i'll set it to one and for the fog intensity i'll set it to back to one like that okay uh, let's try 0 0.4 i think that's gonna be better so that's fog in terms of wind uh, right now i don't have any need for wind but it's basically just strength and direction uh, wind influences or affects the trees the grass and so on so they sway in the wind i think it's a little bit of a gimmick so um it's kind of nice so I'll, I'll i'll actually just change the direction and uh, leave the strength at 0 0.1 have the wind turned on that's fine and precipitation is literally rain or snow or snow so i can make it either more rainy or more snowy <laughs> and if it's more snowy let's go up you can see that all of the horizontal areas receive snow and accumulation of snow which is nice so it's it's like an additional shader that is added to the um, to an already existing uh, shader set right so we have our snow or our uh, rain then if i were to increase the strength you can see that the buildup just increases and in terms of puddles um that's how much it accumulates so strength one puddle one uh, makes it so that the top of the roof is completely covered with snow and it's winter time great okay uh, so in terms of precipitation i will have this turned off naturally for for now uh, i guess for the fog also i will have it turned off just for the sake of clarity wind also if i need them i will turn them them back on later so that is our geometry and sky hdri literally same thing we have the light and the rotation so how much light do we get from hdri more or less and then we can rotate the hdri uh, image that's being wrapped around right uh, you can adjust the color temperature to make it uh, warmer or colder you can adjust the or you can also add the sun a direct sun together with the hdri and the weather is exactly the same except for weather settings except for the cloud coverage you can't have cloud coverage to, together with hdri right so hope that uh, explains it 
Then we have the effects tab right here, but I will get to the effects tab a little bit later because I feel like it's necessary for us to have the materials going before we can move forward. So the way you add materials is, well, there's two ways. Way number one is actually just using uh, the built-in asset library of D5, which is located right here in the top left corner, assets, you click on that, this menu pops up, which basically has a bunch of assets here. And for instance, for the glass, I will just go for glass, transparent glass. Oh yeah, and make sure that you're in the material tab. Material, transparent glass, normal glass. Click on it, it downloads. Once it's downloaded, the tick mark will appear here. And then I just drag and drop it onto my glass like that. Simple as that. Escape. Zoom in. Now this is glass. And the same thing for any other uh, any other texture. So for instance, the terrace planks, these ones, I'll just find wood, grain. Let's see what uh, this is. Uh, ba -ba -ba, cherry, a bunny. Maybe it's floor, wood floor. Yeah, let's try wood floor. Anti-corrosion wood. Maybe that, I'll, I'll just try it out. Drag and drop. Seems to be good. Uh, actually, a little bit. Mm, a little bit. Could be better, could be better. So let's try to find something a little bit nicer. Uh, maybe... Maybe gray. Hey, you need to try, right? So, if the wood planks, let me close that. If the planks, oh, oops, accidentally pressed C. Need to learn how to zoom in properly. One second. That's because my landscape is so so large, uh, so it zooms out quite far away. So with my wood here uh, kind of set up, I I should be able to change the size of it as well as the rotation within the within d5 without needing to go back to uh, rhino so i'll take the pipette tool click on the wood planks material which shows me all of the settings and for now i'm just going to show you the tri planner mapping option right here if if you want your uh, material to be mapped properly onto the geometry try tri planner mapping it basically takes the material checks how big it should be and just projects it on top of the already existing geometry without you needing to do like uv mapping or anything like that in your software it's automatic it doesn't work always but most of the time it does and then if you want to you can rotate your uh, geometry uh, here or your uvs 90 degrees and you can see the planks kind of react to it. I don't like the this wood material, so I'm going to change it. Where were we? As you can see, there's a lot of uh, different options to choose from. So I'm just going to keep keep trying until I, I find something something nice, something that fits. Maybe that. Okay, I think at this point I will forward the video, fast forward the video, if yes. fast forward the video, and uh, and just choose different materials for different uh, objects, right? In, in my scene, just from here. So once I've done that, I will continue the video.
Okay, so this is how far I can push this with the current materials and since this is a tutorial I don't want to um, overdo it, just to say it bluntly. Let's go for 50 millimeters. Um, we will look at problems that you might encounter. So as I was applying the materials, the first thing that uh, struck me was, well, the outer wall right here and the inner wall is the same geometry in my case. I, I'll show you uh, this to you in Rhino. So let me just take these walls and look at them, right? So outside and inside materials, well, the object itself is the same. So that's a problem because I there's no way for me to apply a separate material for this surface, right, without actually getting it in in, on the interior so whatever facade material I have I'll have in the interior or whatever interior material I have I'll have on the facade to mitigate this I will need to create a thin coat of a surface well, well a thin piece of geometry that sits as a facade of my building that is not going to be a big deal a big problem but that is something that i will need to do there's going to be another kind of fast forward of me modeling it besides that everything else seems to be okay um, there is an instance right here now let's go back and look at this right here where this object and this object both of them share the same material so i will need to separate them the way you separate separate objects is well you need to re-import them thankfully it's not going to be as tricky because all i need to do is just select these objects that i want to separate i believe i have all of them yeah i probably do i'll create a new um that should be under under doors most likely new uh, layer and I'll just call it the metal frames metal frames add it to the doors layer make it cyan whatever and for this one I will just create a new material so it's gonna be use a new material there we go different softwares will require you to do custom material that's fine. Uh, different softwares, different ways of creating materials, but you do need a new material for this, uh, these frames here if you want them to be imported separately. Once that is done, I will just hit re uh, synchronize. Right? I'll go back to. Uh, what's the word? D5. I'll go back to D5 and now we can see that this particular frame has a new material that I can apply anything on top of. So under here, under online recent, I will uh, just select poplar, uh, sorry, I will select my black matte metal material here, apply it. And now I can apply a wood material for the frame that I have here because I want this frame to be in wood. So I'll choose poplar, apply it there, call it a day. 
uh, tri planner mapping probably is a good idea with 90% uh, 90 degree rotation there we go so that that is now fixed now you know how to separate out materials um, in terms of the facade yeah I do need to go uh, go fast with this so give me one second i will just separate out sorry not separate out but i will just apply a skin around the facade All right another fast forward there we go okay so i have modeled out this uh, shell that goes around and i have synchronized it with d5 which is still still loading in but yeah the, there it is so now for this, I should be able to just very easily apply, oh no, okay, wood, grain, keep scrolling, just keep scrolling, is it under others, yes, carbon, black, wood, so that's Shosugiban wood, uh, wood tiles, I'll apply triplanar mapping for it, you can see the tiling applied like that so i will rotate it 90 degrees and also i will increase the stretch uh, just so that the planks are a little bit bigger i feel like they're a little bit too small so oops uh, 0 0.5 for the stretch this is how big the texture is this is the offset so where does the texture start 0 0.5 seems to be a little bit I don't know they I, I don't really like it as much also i don't like the texture as much we might need to fix it a little bit later on but for now maybe maybe we will use something else let's take a look wood grain uh doo -doo -doo. just kind of quickly going through the different woods that we have here can't really seem to find anything anything nice what about flooring we ca we can always use something from flooring gray tiled wood yeah maybe apologies for needing to watch me go through the wood i just want it to be you know visually appealing as we will be moving along on anti-corrosion wood sure 28 let's let's go for for this one later we will find something else talking about the pro materials i mean it's not necessary to well, it's not necessary to have pro materials we definitely need the stretchiness of this to be fixed uh two five six something like that oh actually this will uh, this is a good good way for me to talk about mapping the um, some of the materials don't have triplanar mapping which um, creates these kind of problems and these problems usually appear when you have um, really messed up uvs so the best way is to just preemptively apply uvs in rhino so let me show you how to, you how you can do that most of the architecture that we do is boxy unfortunately but it is boxy so you can apply just simple box uh, uv mapping onto your geometry so for my exterior uh, walls select objects i will select all of the objects i'll go to uh, properties uv mapping or texture mapping sorry and i'll choose apply box mapping enter 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 just hit enter until it stops asking questions and here i will lock it to 111 lock and then apply a thousand millimeters for the u v and z or u v w tiling right so basically the texture will be repeated every one meter i will dial it in in d5 so once this is done we again need to uh, synchronize with our d5 browser not browser with our d5 uh, program apparently nvidia drivers are available not right now not right now yes and now you can see that the tiling is correct except that the size is you know 
<laughs> the size is not perhaps not the best so let's fix it so the stretch if we go back to 1 1 then the stretch seems to be actually good so we will keep it at 1 1 maybe 0 0.8 just even bigger tiles something like that seems to be seems to be good we're sticking to it so that's how you can add more more information into your or more geometry into your already existing model now on to more assets so these are the materials we'll go back uh, well sorry we'll come back to materials in a little while when we will begin creating uh, our custom materials and i'll t t touch upon it much more but for now uh, let's jump into this model tab right that we have right here so under models here you can see that there's a bunch from which you can choose so i will show you just a few uh, just to kind of uh, explain how they work so under nature come on under nature we have like trees uh, all different kinds of trees all different kinds of hedges vines and so on so all of these assets are available to you to just kind of pick and choose which ones you want and plop them on the scene the way you do it is well it's twofold for the trees and the rocks and whatnot you don't really want to plop them like so let's let's find a nice tree uh, so that i can explain broadleaf sure let's go for actually i kind of like conifers yeah i want a conifer forest here and let's go for beautiful pine trees pinus um are there like bigger ones oh i like that okay this one i like this one clearly you should choose more than one tree there we go so i just select it plop it in place escape and that's that's my tree as i zoom into it you can see it's pretty good quality pretty high detail like every single uh needle needle is there the trunk should have a little bit more resolution but for what it is it's fine it's it's gonna do its job so I could start, you know, messing around with the trees this way, you know, plopping another one, rotating it a little bit so that it looks unique and then kind of keep keep building up my forest that way. But a much faster way is by using the brush tool. So what I mean by brush is, let me just move up, there we go. You can uh, create this B, the brush. I think you just type in B. Yeah, you just click B to brush things on, right? Like that. And you can apply or you can tick mark what kind of uh, what kind of trees would you like to brush brush on. So let me choose a little bit more. Uh, you can see the tick mark right here. Let me choose a few more. All of the Larix trees uh maybe some more <gasps> that one's pretty and that one's pretty okay this one uh, too i really really love trees I'm, I'm gonna be honest like that oops uh don't need that there we go something like so should should be fine and oh yeah uh one more thing once that is downloaded come on please come on okay fine while it's downloading i'll explain how the brush works so right now just a quick show showing just i'm just moving my mouse around uh, actually let me make my display smooth It's, it's better to see it this way. So as I'm brushing on, the trees are created, right? Easy. I can also use the eraser tool to erase the trees. The eraser tool is the, next to the brush tool. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Come on. <laughs> I guess that one is just placed. Yes, that one is just placed. My bad, my bad. Okay, so back to the brush tool. I have all of these trees selected. For some reason, this one doesn't download. I really wish it did. I really like the way it looks. But for now, um, I'm just going to get this one. Uh, this one in just to get a little bit more of a variety of trees. And as I... Um, where is it? As I click this little icon right here, you can see right next to the brush eraser path tool, there is this little arrow. As I click on it, uh, there are the settings for the trees or, or for the brushing in this case. Uh, so you, you can change the radius so you can have a really large brush and you just kind of do uh, a single drag and it's a whole damn forest. Don't mind the quality or actually we like to see things pretty right so i'm gonna stick to the <laughs> stick to the quality uh to the high quality for some reason it's not changing the quality hello precise please calculate maybe it takes a while for it to re recalculate it's gonna kick in eventually that's fine so the quality uh, that that's that's going to be sorted out back to the settings brush so that's the radius of the brush right the density of how dense should each tree oops should each tree be uh, or the density of the forest i guess in this case the size so the size of my assets so how big should the trees be? If my size is low, you can see that the trees are very small. If the, the size is large, the trees are large. So typically you want the size to be somewhere around the middle, just so that it's not uh, too much, right? And then random size, so how varied the tree sizes are. So it goes between very, very small and very, very big here. I usually have a little bit of random si uh, like size variety, but uh, not too much. Align to terrain means that if you have a slope, if you have a slope, then the tree will be will not be growing vertically up, but rather will be growing at an angle. You don't hmm, no no that's not natural. They tend to grow vertically up. Uh, since I made a lot of boo-boos here, I will just choose the eraser tool and delete and increase the radius of the eraser tool and just delete everything uh, like so. Okay, time to actually grow freaking forest. So with my tree selected here and with my brush enabled, let's see if I can just literally drag around like so, to quickly create a pretty dense forest around my building. Just like that. Hey, that's perfect. Um, for some reason, the, let, let, let's uh, go back here, turn off the brush, uh, the brush tool altogether, minimize that. Oh, there we go. Now it kicked in. <laughs> I think while the brush tool was was working, it didn't really want to uh, want to kick in. But now, now, now we have it running. You can see that my frame rate drops down quite uh, dramatically, and I wanted to say that uh, the trees should be. Uh, like the trees, they are brushed on top of my um, of my landscape model, meaning that they are a part of it, uh, which inherently means that I can't really add them to the separate layer, which is very weird. I, I wish uh, it was possible to disconnect um, to to disconnect the trees from the geometry. Right? and then just to have them separately but alas it's not what you can do though is you can select the trees like that and then here on the right hand side you'll see brush records option 
you expand that which shows you brush history you know of what trees were used to brush on and then you can click on this little uh, eye icon right here to hide them so you can you know once the trees are brushed on you can just hide them so that they don't slow you down okay once that is done it's time to scatter some stuff close to the building guess how you do that it's exactly the same way right assets uh, this time it's not gonna be trees uh, we're going to find some uh, stones for instance there we go some stones here or low poly trees like low poly trees are very uh, very good for far range uh, as far range objects right something that I used right now um, to create a forest should be not used as a high density asset meaning it shouldn't be used for that you typically want to use a low polygon tree let me show it to you come on Plop. plop it in and as i zoom in you'll see that the leaves they like for instance here yeah, this is a good good example here they're all flat because they're all on the same plane right so this is a single polygon for instance and all of the trees uh, tree leaves are just a single texture this is a much lower resolution tree and it's gonna mess up your files much less if you want to if, if you don't have a strong computer all right so just keep that in mind just wanted to you know force you to notice it um then we have like rocks and stuff like that and these are the ones that i'm actually gonna gonna be using so for instance a rock like so if i plop it in you can see it's uh quite quite nicely integrates with the landscape and it increases like the the look like it, it makes it look better but for the rocks i will use them uh, without a brush uh, for um, manually right each rock added manually but for the uh, for brushed on stuff i guess no first let's do the rocks first let's do the rocks so I'll, I'll add the rocks and then we will brush on the remainder a little bit later so rock 11 something like that add it in and there it is rock 15 download it plop it in place if you want to sink it into the ground a bit more but then again then there it is right and so on right so take your time add as much of information like landscape information into your scene as possible because that will make it more believable uh, it will make it look nicer right i will do this step in a fast forward way after the next little thing that i want to show you and that thing is called downloading assets and actually applying them in your scene right so what if there is a rock that you want to have that is on the internet somewhere a 3d model on the internet and it's not part of your uh, library right here you need to download it let me show you that so just a second. So the website that I love using for downloading different stuff is called 3D Scans or uh, Quixel Mega Scans. What am I saying? I'm getting tired, I guess. Quixel Mega Scans Library. And here uh, you can download 3D assets as well as materials. Under surfaces, you have all the materials, which we will get to in just a sec. In, term, in terms of 3D assets, you have your buildings, food, blah, 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 right? So let me just go uh, to nature, 3D assets, nature, and just kind of get something in there, in my little file. So let's see, mossy forest boulder, and you, here you can see you can choose like the resolution and so on for downloading it um this requires a login 
for you to register. Create an account with Epic Games, which is free to create an account with them. And then you will be able to download as many assets as you want for free completely. You don't even need to look at the points here, right? So this is completely free if you register with Epic Games. I will click on the little, oops, sorry. Click on the little gear icon here and just choose what kind of assets do I want to download. So it's gonna be an FBX file format, that's fine. Uh, MetaHumans, we're not using MetaHumans, we don't care. And for LODs, this is level of detail. We only care about the LOD zero. That is the highest level, uh, level of detail model. Everything else uh, that's used in video games, we don't really care about that. So we'll use LOD zero. Uh, technically, you could use high poly source as well, but that is very, very heavy. So don't, don't, please don't. Anyway, now for the texture settings, we have a, a bunch of different textures to choose from of what we want. For D5, if I were to select any kind of material here, you can see the channels that we will be dealing with. Right, so we have our texture color. That's just a regular, like a al albedo color. We have the normals. We have specular, roughness, metallic, ambient occlusion, and height. So these are the channels that we will be using. Right. So back in here, where is it? Hello. There we go. Back in here, we need to now remember what is it. It's gonna be albedo for sure. We're not dealing with cavity. We're not dealing with curvature. With is it glossiness? It's not. It's roughness. So we're not dealing with glossiness. We will need roughness. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with normal maps. Perfect. We will need that. Normal bump, normal object. We don't need those. Displacement. Yes. Bump. No. Ambient occlusion. Do we have ambient occlusion here? Yes, we do we will get ambient occlusion. Uh, metalness, yes. Diffuse. Um, diffuse and albedo are virtually the same thing. So I would just suggest tick marking uh, diffuse as well, just to get both of them and see which one you prefer. Roughness, yes. Specular, I believe we have specular. Yes, we do. Specular, tick mark that. We don't need fuzz, we don't need translucency, uh, we don't need opacity, we don't need brush. We don't need transmission. Transmission is transparency, basically. Right? Unique maps per LOD when available. Sure, uh, have that tick mark. So this is your settings for downloading the asset. Once you're do uh, done, click back, click on download. Oh, and uh, it's downloading at 8K. Let me cancel that. You don't need 8K resolution for what you're going to be doing. 4K is more than enough. Use 8K resolution of textures only if your asset is literally in, in your face, in the camera. If it's not going to be in the camera, like five centimeters away from the camera, don't. Uh, just use 4K resolution. It's going to be fine. Once the asset is downloaded, one second. There we go. Once the asset is downloaded, it's going to come in as a zip file. You extract it. And I'll just call it nature, rock, mossy. Move it to nature. There it is. And I have all of my like different, different maps here and different, uh, want to see settings it's not settings like a 3d model is fbx different maps and the preview right so back in the five first thing that i want to do is i want to import the 3d model how do i do that well i'll just create a new layer call it rocks rocks there we go and i'll just 
drag and drop in my LOD of Mossy Rock right here. Uh, doesn't want to do that. Why? One second. Did, uh, am I already... Have I already forgotten? I guess I need to click on the import right here. So import and then we go to rock mossy right here and click on open. So that little icon right here is import. Once that is done, then under, not under object, but under imported, your FBX file will appear, which uh, you will be able to place anywhere you want in the scene. Plop, we just place it. There it is. Look at it. All white and shiny and nice. Uh, if it imports too small, too big, you can always scale it. Make it bigger, make it smaller. Uh, you can also move it around. If you want to plop it on the ground, you can always select it. And here under... Mm, my apologies. Okay, I, I figured it out. I, I was losing my mind. Because I wanted it to be plopped on the ground. And I was trying to right click on this imported, this rock file right here. But this is the file. This is basically the file that is linked into D5. This is not the rock that we currently have. The actual rock that we have selected is now under object, objects because it's placed in the viewport. So under objects right here, I can see my rock as it is here. I can right click on its name and choose to uh, drop vertically and just drops to my ground. That's uh, quite convenient because you can drop uh, different things, make sure that the table is on the ground, make sure that the chair is on the ground, yada yada, you understand, right? So that's that's my rock. Okay, now creating textures for the rock. I will uh, pick, use the material picker, pick the material of the rock, which already has like a material template set. It's set to custom, that's fine with with us it's basically waiting for for us to give it a color map a normal specular roughness metallic and ambient occlusion and also we can make it glow if you want it to be emissive but that is later uh we don't need it to glow uh right now well we won't need the rock to glow at all anyway so here we have all of our um different maps and the first one is albedo. So let me just see. Yeah, I can just drag and drop. Never mind. I can't just drag and drop my albedo map into here. I do need to navigate through the base color map here by clicking on the little icon, navigate to my rock mossy and choosing the albedo color like that. Now the rock has some color. Actually, let me uh, delete this and let me show you uh, with the base color set to mid gray, how you can make sure that your maps that you're using are correct because the rock needs to look okay even without the base color map. Sorry for jumping back and forth, but this is kind of an important thing for um, an important thing to practice. Uh, first adding all of the other colors or sorry other maps and only then adding the color um, because it needs to look natural even without the color so under normal i'll choose the normal map okay give it a second and you can see that the normal map starts popping in right and I will give it a more of a bump. So I'll, I'll switch the normal to one and check the additional settings where I basically can have a linear or sRGB. And you'll notice that if I have sRGB, it looks inverted and it's all weird. So no, it's going to be linear. If I remember correctly, 
uh, we don't need to use uh, individual uh, apologies we don't need to use individual UVs so it does need to be straight up linear okay we have the normal which is like the bumpiness of it the bump information of it uh, we have that information then for specular just select the specular map open that one up bam so with specular map I'll also increase it to one I believe this one yeah this one actually can stay being linear that's fine with specular map set to one um, it we're controlling how glossy different areas of the rock are let me uh, make the camera a little bit slower so that we can move around a bit more conveniently like that right so that's specular roughness map is well specular is uh, the highlights basically how prone to highlights is the surface of the material is the roughness is actually how glossy the surface is so how much how reflective it is right so i'll add the roughness map open doesn't seem like it changed much let me ramp it up to one uh the the settings here they shouldn't matter uh, the only setting that matters is roughness uh, sorry normal sorry not the settings the numbers shouldn't matter the only number that should matter is normal because you can con control the strength with the normal map then for metallic you can see that there's no metallic map and clearly this is not a metallic object so let me just show you if it was set to one if metallic was set to one this is how it would react you can see that the shadow is fully black and if metallic is set to zero you know it's uh, like stone or something like that uh, typically materials in nature are either one or zero in the scale they're never in the middle and then ambient occlusion so let's see okay there's no ambient occlusion here actually okay that's that's interesting we don't use it but if i look at this closely i can see that there's also a displacement map here but i don't have anywhere where i can add this the displacement map in my material rollout and that is because my material template is set to custom while if I expand this right here, there's a bunch of different material templates. One of them being displacement, right? So if I use displacement material template, you can see that I still have normal specular roughness, but now I had the height map here also, right? And it's very funky if we, <laughs> if we just play with it, but we will be using uh displacement map here for it right oof why mm? that's weird oh it doesn't doesn't work in oh no it doesn't work at all in 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 this uh program Hey, it is what it is. We don't use that. We don't use the displacement. We stay in custom. Yikes. <laughs> we stay in custom. Even without displacement, and typically you don't really use displacement that much. This is pretty good. I feel like this is a like a pretty convincing rock, even without any color. Right? So now let's add color. Base color map. Bam. Our albedo color. Bam wait for it to load in there we go that's our little rock right here looks fine looks like a rock okay great so it is done we're back we're back um i probably i haven't even paused the video i'm sorry <laughs> but basically the specular as well as the roughness all of these maps need to be in srgb mode rather than linear mode i 
I'm sorry. I keep jumping between different programs and I constantly forget. So to keep things as clean as possible, the albedo color map is sRGB, right? The normal map is always linear, always linear, normal, linear. Specular roughness maps, both are sRGB, right? Then you get a clean looking model. All right. So with that done, finally, we can take this rock and we can place it anywhere we want in the scene. All right. Now uh, I can use this. Where is it? Imported. I can use this uh, asset as my, or rather this asset, as my uh, scattering object. So the way you do it is you right click on the asset that you have and you add to local right here, add to local. What it just did was if I now go to assets here and I choose rather than online, I choose local. There is my little rock, right? This one right here. I'm not sure what this is. Let me just quickly hit delete on it. But this is my, my rock, which I can now place as, you know, like a, a direct copy of it. Meaning that I can also, I believe, uh, brush. No, I cannot brush, uh, brush with the, uh, with local assets, which is unfortunate, but at least I can now easily pick, pick it and keep copying it and moving it and so on. Right. So we have that going for us, which is nice. Right. So those are our rocks. So now we have learned how you can import a 3D object and texture it <clears throat> with the textures that come with it. Um, I will show or I will say rather one one thing that I feel like is quite quite important. Even though uh, technically the roughness as well as the roughness as well as the specular needs to be set to one for it to be accurate you can play with these uh, values until you will get something that will look natural right so it doesn't necessarily need need to be um how do i say this uh it, it doesn't need to be one to one right so it just just direct your uh, geometries in a way or your your maps in a way that looks the best i shouldn't need to say this but yeah so now in terms of importing materials it's quite similar so if i go to quixel and go to surfaces let's find some wood board Scroll, scroll, scroll. Wood board wall. That looks pretty decent. Um, planks. Uh, amongst the planks. Mm, that looks quite nice. Painted. No. Uh, wooden planks. Mm, that one also looks quite nice. Yeah, I usually take a long time with the <laughs> with the materials, but here I will just jump the gun and just choose this one uh, look at the settings seems like everything that we have set up before uh, stays and I'll just hit download right it downloads my planks I will all preemptively go back to quicksell don't need that zip file anymore show in folder there we go don't look at my downloads there's nothing there actually then for wood plank just get it in here extract you know the literally the same process as what we did before 
let's go to textures and I'll just add it in here. So now I have my wood planks texture and this time we do have ambient occlusion, which is great. That's what I want to see. Now in here, I want to replace this material with my wood planks material. So I'm just going to uh, pipette it. I have it here. I'll just delete all of the maps that I have here. There we go. Delete all of the maps and slap on new ones from my downloaded. Uh, so, as per usual, no base color map yet. We start with the normal. Normal map. Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, where is my uh, nature? Nope, it's under textures. With planks. And we do normal. Open. Pop. That one pops in. It's pretty straightforward. If I zoom in, you can see the, the plank normals right here. Let me expand this. Make sure that it's in linear. It is. Close it. Specular. Uh, there it is. Ramp it up to like 0.5. Roughness. There we go. Roughness is here. Uh, perhaps it's a little bit too much, so I'm gonna tone it down. The lower the roughness, the more glossy it is, so maybe we kind of want it. Pretty rough. Linear. So roughness is set to linear. I want it to be sRGB, like that. Hmm. Maybe this one does need to stay linear. It's always tricky to, to know for a fact. Um, sometimes they they kind of flip-flop. Don't worry about it. Metallic, uh, we don't have any... Nope, there's no metallic. We close that and we just make it zero. Oh, that's why. So metallic is was set to one. So this was acting like it's metal. So actually metallic needs to be zero and roughness doesn't need indeed need to be sRGB. Like that, back to 0 0.5. There we go. Now, now it's starting to make sense. So it was treating it as it was metal. Ambient occlusion, we choose ambient occlusion map. That is basically darkening the crevices, the nooks and the crannies of the texture. As you can see here, this is without AO. This is with AO. Quite, quite useful. Right? And then the height map, uh, well, hey, let's try. Let's try one more time to see if the height map will actually work. If I increase it, um, really don't like it. No, I, I don't like it. I'll, 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 I will not be using height maps in, in this tutorial uh, or this course at all. So, we don't need metallic, we don't need height map. Uh, this looks fine as it is uh, with single color, but we will indeed use our albedo color. Bam, darkens. Looks pretty convincing to me. A little bit too glossy, so I'll increase the roughness map a bit more. Yep, something like that. Seems fine. We will fix the brightness contrast uh, a bit later. Uh, I know that it, it's all over the place. So that's how you import the texture. One very important thing that I kind of want to talk about is the surface... Uh, how do you call them? Uh, rounding. Rounding of a shape. Rounding of a corner. So there is not a single, also I'm looking at this and I don't like what I see. Uh, that needs to be triplanar mapped. Okay, so there's not a single thing in the world that has a perfect 90 degree 
corner which ends up at one single edge right everything is sharpened or sorry rounded if you look at your table if you look at your keyboard your mouse any edge anywhere it has a fillet it has a small little little fillet those edges they catch light and when they catch light they make things more believable they make things look more natural right so technically you could bake in that performance in rhino already or in your modeling software by filleting all of the edges but thankfully um, you don't need to do that you can do that here in inside of your material in any material you can choose round corner so for instance for these frames let me just kind of go in here pretty aggressively there we go this corner right that's super sharp i can round the corner to create this highlight here right and the radius is three millimeters and that's enough three millimeters is fine actually and now as i zoom out you can see that the that my frame catches the light and that is very important for realism so if if this is the only thing that you will get from this tutorial is that you do need to round the corners for all of your uh, geometries well not all of them but most of your geometries three millimeters uh, seems to be like a sweet spot that's i guess i guess that's why they chose it right so three millimeters to round the corners for everything i wish there was like a round corner for everything button but there is no none none so I'm, I'm doing it manually for instance here wonder if we need more nah that looks fine yeah that that's catching light the way it should be that's good okay so we can we can go around and just round the corners for as much as we can but uh, eventually i'll need to give in because i need to run the rest of the tutorial well, actually here these planks right here those those really scream please round me there we go you're welcome planks you're welcome all right so that's the round color limit color bleeding i still am not sure what that does it feels like it uh, when, when we have the color bleeding uh, limited right here it doesn't get a uh, color from the outside world so to say so uh, these planks with limited color bleeding will not get colored by the sky as much by indirect light um or they will not color other objects. I'm not sure, I don't use this, so I can't, can't help you with that. Uh, there are some uh, areas here that I still haven't textured that are, where, where are you? Yeah, there we go. These paintings, this gallery for, for, uh, for the client, I will leave this be for now. We will uh, get back to this, but the principle is still the same. You, you take the color map, you slap it on, and thus you paint the painting, right? You add the painting, but you need to download the texture. We'll do that, but a little bit later. For now, I believe it's time for me to do the mm, kind of sur surroundings. But I think before we do that, we, we should talk about scenes, about making, making scenes, because here we already have enough material for us to choose. Well, that, that's a very boring thing, but <laughs> it is what it is. Let's just say we have enough material for us to choose uh, the angles for our renders, right? So 
you choose the rendering or on which angle will you be rendering from by uh, creating scenes right different scenes because different scenes can have different uh, light conditions different uh, object viewing kind of conditions some some things can be hidden in one scene and shown in the other like that um, which means that each scene can be custom made to fit with the feel that you're after for the rendering right so uh, for each scene you want to make a separate render and the way you do you make scenes is you just literally frame the view actually let me go for the grid it's gonna be useful here Mm, perhaps something like that. Yeah, something like that should be fine. So, and then you just create new scene. There we go. That's your scene. And you just call it scene one or uh, front. Yeah, there we go. That's that's your scene. Uh, then you want to perhaps make another one. Let's make another one. Uh, maybe closer to the ground. Something like this. Bam. Sure. Uh, and add scene you add another one and you call it I don't know uh, two-thirds like that now you can see as I click on scene one and scene two there's there's a transition which is very nice so it's like an animation and I can jump between them uh, quite quite easily uh, I'll make a few more scenes on the interior let's use the central space as our framing for the look that we're after so perhaps something like that maybe even further out oh, we're all already there yep something like that add sure I've seen 24 that's that's fine let's say the staircase is probably nice so let's let's add a scene like this with the with the staircase showing right bam so you just keep adding scenes and you can switch between them quite quite easily okay so what about the scenes well you can now for each scene you can change some settings right so let me for instance here uh, go to camera and or not necessarily camera sorry uh, go and change the light angle to something like this and then as we are moving between the scenes you can see that my light changes so let me make it more dramatic it's night time now <laughs> night time in the front view daytime in the two-thirds view right so as i said you can make your um what oh it's back to to normal oh right right um i'm sorry so as you make it into night time you need to click on this update scene button right here for it to update i have emissive lights uh, in the in the ceiling so it's shining uh light by itself don't worry about it so I'll just update the scene you can see it's updated now and as I move you know it, it moves to the new uh, it moves to the two-thirds scene and thus changes the the lights so back to front I'll, I'll just find the light angle that is nice and I don't really need to see the grid anymore. So let's find the light angle. And also, also while we're here, I'll select the object of the ground and I'll just choose to show the trees, right? Because I want to see the trees. 
brightness to see uh, their shadows. And now let's mess around with the light. Something like this, perhaps. And the north offset. We could do... Could do something like that. Like completely backlit. But I feel like that that might be problematic with, uh, with assets that are here. And also this is uh, becoming very, very mirror-like. Uh, so that, that might be a problem as well. Uh, so maybe two-thirds... Uh, something something like that a little bit of light that hits okay and it just goes a little bit more down perfect right so we have something like this then I will control the clouds clearly uh, so amount of clouds a little bit less Thickness of clouds, a little bit less. Yeah, something like that. Then for the camera, I will uh, change my... Actually, I'll change my... Uh, how is this called? Uh, lens focal length to something a little bit bigger. Uh, 70 millimeters. Ooh, uh, that zooms in quite a bit. I will need to move away. That is fine. We'll do that. Display, grid... I'll fix the trees in just a second. For now, I want to fix the grid. Mm, does that work? Feels like that might work. Okay, let's have it like that. Uh, so you can see that now, let me reset or update the scene now. And you can see that the trees are now a problem, quite, quite a problem in this case. So I need to get rid of them. To get rid of the trees in that particular area where I will... Where I'll take the picture from. It's that area right there. Um, I need to erase them. And I will erase them. I wonder if it's possible. Apply an eraser tool. Yeah, there we go. It is possible to just erase them like so. So I'm literally just erasing them here. Go back to front view. Take a look here. Delete that tree. Delete that tree. I probably need a bigger eraser. So bigger radius. Bam. Come on. Trying to get to that tree. It's not as easy as it looks. Okay, let's let's make it make it happen. Uh There we go. That one also. Come on. Please work. Cooperate. Cooperate. There we go. That tree disappears and that tree disappears. Whew. That was uh, harder than it should have been. And we still have one more. This one should be fine. Just erase it like that. Oh, it doesn't want to be erased. That's great. Still doesn't want to be erased. The hell are you? Why don't you want to be removed? Why can't I remove you? Hello? Slightly annoying. One second. Come on. There we go. I think I think that's that for that stream. No, it wasn't. <laughs> No, it it indeed wasn't. So let's turn around and take a look at it. It's probably this one then. I'm just gonna do this. I don't care. Oh my god. Which one are you? Are you that one? Are you these two? I'm gonna destroy the whole damn forest before I... <laughs> oh 
Ó. Is it even here? Oh, it's here. Yeah, and uh, this cannot be deleted. So I'm trying to delete it and I cannot. For some reason, it's completely stuck. So we try from the bottom. And apparently it was anchored for some reason to the bottom, not to the top. And now this should be fine. Yes, now this is fine. Now we have finally, yikes, uh, finally we have our scene here. So I don't need to run the eraser tool anymore. This whole thing just works. Okay. With camera set now to 72 millimeters apparently. Actually 70, I want 70. 70 millimeters, uh, I can choose depth of field and focus in on my, let's see, let's see it like that. If I focus on the ground, um, you can see that the, oh, yeah, that's the blur, right? Yeah. So if I focus on this ground plane, you can see that everything else gets blurred. If I focus on the building, the ground gets blurred and we want to blur the ground clearly, right? So um, you typically we do depth of field, we set the focus onto the facade and then we just tone the blur until, you know, it's, it's nice, until it looks nice. Of course, we will have more stuff here, so it's not going to be as, as clunky. Um, then <clears throat> for the exposure value, this is uh, overexposed by far. Uh, so I'm just going to I disable the auto exposure and tur turn 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 down the exposure value to 0 uh, 0.05 perhaps something like that for now right that's our exposure value uh, everything else seems to be a okay so i'm just gonna save my settings for this one and for now have it the way it is then for render number two for this one this is actually pretty good already um, i kind of want the sun to be a little bit lower i want the shadows of the trees to hit the facade uh, so i'm just going to move the north offset like that There we go. And the sun probably needs to be a little bit lower. Just a little bit. There we go. That honestly looks pretty good. Uh, so I'm just going to reset this. So as you can see, I'm, I'm just walk, uh, going around every scene here and setting up the light as well as the camera, right? So exposure value, we change the exposure until we like it. Something like that. Actually zero. Yeah, it's literally zero EV, but auto exposure turned off. Um, and for our angle, this is where things get nasty again. Uh, I do like my angle to be like 70 uh, or not angle focal length to be around 70. Yeah, we're back in the woods, boys. Back in the woods. But this time we know the trick, so it should be much easier to, to fix. Uh, let's increase the radius. And just go to town, deleting the trees uh, for our camera. Uh, those will probably not hurt. So we'll have them. Uh, this one gets removed okay with that done and with grid enabled let's find the camera angle that is most efficient or not efficient most aesthetic something like that let's take a look how does that uh, I don't like where that ends so maybe something like that Sure, why not? So we'll have have it like that. So I'll just reset and call it good. Then scene 24. 
For this one, we don't really care about the trees. Let me escape out of my tool. Um, everything here seems to be kind of okay. Let's play around with the light until we we get something that looks nice. Oh, I like that. I like that. Uh, we're sticking to this. Uh, for camera, I uh, don't really need to do anything here. Oh, forgot the depth of field for that one. That's fine. We'll go back. Uh, set focus. Uh, let's focus in on that table right there. Defocus everything else. Like seven. Um, auto uh, exposure. Turn that off. Yeah, that looks fine. That looks fine. So we keep it for now reset good uh, back to here forgot the defocus so set focus on to the facade as per usual and around six seven uh, you can do ten you can see how blurry this gets we'll be able to change this uh, on a moment's notice right oh wait did it Oh, my bad. I accidentally... Okay, let's try again. Look at this uh, branch right here. Top left corner. Keep looking at it. I'm increasing the defocus. Whoa. Now it's not important anymore, right? Now it's not destroying our composition anymore. That's very nice. So, update scene. Okay, let's take a look. We have that. That's nice. We have that. That's nice that looks good it needs more stuff of course but looks fine and then that uh this needs a little bit more love so much deeper with uh light definitely hitting the stairs but i will have like a tree in here a bonsai tree in here so we want like an evening light that will hit the bonsai tree. So something like this. Um, I don't really want it to hit. Oh. There we go. That actually might might look pretty damn good. So let's try this one out. Uh, depth of field, set focus. We focus on the block and defocus the whole damn thing. Uh, reset. Oh yeah, uh, exposure, uh, turn auto exposure off. Look at this. Okay, we're getting somewhere, aren't we, right? This this is starting to look like something. It's still bad, it's still really bad. We're still far out. Check out where we are in the video. You know, we're still a ways to go, but this is looking like something. It feels like I've been recording for four and a half hours. So I will take a little bit of a break and then continue on from there. For you, it's just going to be like, and I'm back. <laughs> okay, let's stop it here.
Okay, so I've added a few things. I couldn't leave it be. Um, didn't didn't want to go to sleep without having it kind of done, at least on the on the greenery side of things. With that being said, there is still some some work to be done there. But basically now the front view looks like this. The side view like that. Then we have our first interior shot and we have our second interior shot. So the main thing that was changed was uh, of course the greenery right i've also played around a little bit with the light but there's nothing uh no no fancy stuff happened while you weren't looking one thing that i still haven't done was i haven't added any textures to the painting so they're kind of green um i want to fix that so i'll do that right now instead of a base color right here i'll use base color map click that uh, click on the icon for the texture go to the textures and just choose one of these maybe this one Malevich there we go and yeah the base color needs to be fixed it needs to be white and now there should be no green left is it still green or is it me no no it, it's just residues of the calculation so just zooming in here and taking a closer taking a closer look let me turn off the depth of field for a bit it actually is pretty close already that the seam right here that's not great but eh, i will not be fixing that that's fine with me we will be looking at this either way through the uh, facade right so straight on <clears throat> In terms of roughness, perhaps, wait, is that roughness zero? Mm, that's strange, it should be, so if it if roughness is set to zero, then it should be highly reflective, right? Oh, and it is, never mind. And it is highly reflective, so we will find a balance for it. Roughness 0 0.75 and specular yeah, it's glazed, so it's quite specular, 0 0.8, something like that. So again, specular highlights, right? So how much is it prone to generating highlights? Uh, let's go back to the front view. Yeah, you can see the little painting right there. Now it's gonna look a little bit more, a little bit more natural. One more thing that I don't really like is the glass. The glass needs to be fixed. So I'm going to pipette tool, a glass, and let's think. So I'm thinking of not having it completely clear. It's too clear, right? So it needs to be a little bit darker because this kind of a facade would be slightly tinted. So to create tinted glass, all you need to do is change the base color something that's a little bit darker and actually I'm gonna switch it up and change this to like that then a little bit towards blue mm, that's green that's uh, that's a little bit too much there we go then I'll push it back in and just find the value that kind of works. And this seems to be the value. Do I like it? Uh, maybe it's a little bit too much. So I'm gonna bring it in a little bit closer. Value 95. There we go. Something like that. Uh, just slightly uh, tinted. Then I'll increase the roughness just a little bit. 0 0.05. Uh, just to get rid of that reflection, uh, to soften that reflection a bit. And I think with that we are done with the with the glass. Yeah. The glass is done. Then what's next? Well, that corner right there needs a little bit more love. So let me just grab an asset real quick. 
from my models um, <laughs> nature rocks what do we place perhaps this kind of a rock can be placed there oh come on placed there we go escape out of that navigate it so I'll, I'll just move it slightly in closer to us there we go and now it can rotate yep something like that so it breaks breaks apart that problem the problem here in the far background I'll fix that by introducing more greenery oh come on go away just yoink there we go something like that so brushing is great remember uh, you select the greenery and you have your brushing records and you can hide them to make things go faster right so this is without any any greenery whatsoever looks pretty bad doesn't it greenery always makes things look better keep that in mind right let's go into the building and check out the interior here so the thing that i don't like is this chevron tiling here because it's eaten up by the by the wooden kind of furniture right here right so the chevron needs to be tiles and i already have pretty nice tiles honestly that are right here these bad boys they're a little bit too glossy though yeah i'm fine fine with that so i will just find the name of them lauren platinum light gray tile great and I'll just apply it to here so I can as I have that uh, tile uh, how do you call it P uh, picked pipette tooled <laughs> as I have that material pipette tooled I will then duplicate it like so or this I uh, icon right here what does that do no, never mind I will duplicate it and I'll apply it to here right as easy as that now we have tiles here that are grayish and that chevron that we used i'll want to apply it here but 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 we have a problem and the problem is called this whole piece of geometry like the exterior as well as the interior interior is one piece so i can't um can't apply chevron here without applying chevron to my out uh, skirting right here for the building foundation block of the building so to fix that in rhino i have already you, you won't need to wait but i have already separated out where i'll want my wood flooring to be so i do need to synchronize not connected right right so i need to connect it uh does it work yeah okay so once you connect it it automatically uh refreshes let's wait for it and that should work besides that nothing has been changed in rhino everything is exactly the same kind of going through all of this to just double check if i'm not missing anything yeah seems to be fine oh yeah yeah one thing i've changed the ends right here i don't remember if i talked about them but basically the ends i didn't like how this material was tiling uh, at the ends of the roof so i've just created these small little plates that are like one centimeter in thickness and these are just metal plates added to the ends okay let's take a look yeah you can see here for instance uh, zoom in zoom in zoom in like that uh focus like that right as easy as that also the tiling what the hell <laughs> why is the tiling so bad so now here i can actually add the wood floor flooring wood flooring right so i will 
go to assets, material, wood, grain, wait for it, or wait, maybe it's amongst the recent, recently used ones, poplar, cedar wood, yeah, uh, these get removed, <clears throat> the recently used uh, materials get removed if you remove them from your scene. Right, so it's not in this list anymore. That's okay. I will just go back into... It is under wood probably, right? Grain. Let's look at the end of it. Birch. No, it's not there. Oh my god, so many. Which is a good thing, <laughs> in general. Okay, it's gonna be under floor, wood floor. Mm -hmm. uh, pum, pum, pum. Chevron, chevron, chevron. Where are the brown, black, oh. uh, Where are you, chev chevron? Herringbone. Oh, it's called herringbone uh, here, okay. So this one, pretty bright, that's fine with me. Oh, that tiling was wrong but now it's okay so that's pretty yellow that's okay we will fix it later for now do i like it yeah i do i do i i think it looks great so back to our front view bam now we have that all material set let's enable the greenery it takes a while to load then, especially when I'm recording, so I don't... Hopefully for you it's gonna be faster. <laughs> Let's switch it up here. Switch it back. Should refresh. Yep, it does. There we go. Now, with this done, uh, the next step is to actually introduce lights. So we will be adding lights with this little uh, tool right here. Right, so the first thing for us to do is to actually we need to get in there right and then start shining light onto different things and basically if you click on this icon right here you'll see you have point li point light spotlight strip light or rectangular light for this uh, part of the tutorial i'm going to show you the rectangular light and then we'll kind of build it up from there so choose rectangular light and you can see you can add it anywhere you want so let's zoom in to a part where we're actually gonna add it i'll go for my scene uh 24 the interior scene uh go up to one of these these are wall washers right so these are like rectangles on which lights should be added i will change this to smooth display and i'll turn off the camera focus depth of field because it's <laughs> A little bit annoying and basically we will be adding the light on well first of all these two so rectangular light i choose that and as i hover my mouse over the top surface of my wall washer you can see that it's added right if i just hover my mouse anywhere it's also added so let me just add it in anywhere and just have it kind of floating about and let's talk about the settings of this light so rectangular light clearly is a rectangle that shines light right as simple as that uh, you have the location for it you see you have the rotation for it and you have the size right so i don't really like rotating the lights with a gumball i prefer using precise rotations for them so i'm just going to rotate it around the x-axis by 180 degrees so that it shines upwards that's what i want then I will change its size to be, I guess, 6 by 6 centimeters, something like that. So 60 by 60 millimeters. There we go. That's my light. Let me, let me add it closer to the wall so that you can see how it shines. Oh, by the way, to zoom in to an object, you press Z. Z key zooms in. To whatever you have selected right so with the light being 60 
uh, millimeters in x and y uh, dimensions, it's become pretty weak because the strength of it is proportional to the size of it, right? So I need to increase the intensity. I'll increase it to like 100 or so. Actually, let's take a look at it with the precise preview. Yeah, that looks fine. Okay. So 100 for intensity. Then bar door, barn door angle as well as barn door length. Uh, these two control the spread. You can see that right now, the as I have a rectangular light, it starts completely horizontal and it fills in the whole space, right? So the spread of it is 180 degrees. I can increase the barn door length like so. Let's let's do like 30. Just do 30. And bar door barn door very hard <laughs> angle just start making it smaller as you make it smaller you can see that you're kind of closing in on the light so you're controlling the spread of it i will keep it at uh, let's go for 60 degrees something like that and for the length maybe a little bit less or actually this is just an indicator so it won't really matter then I will take the light, let's zoom into it, and I'll position it. Probably need to fly a little bit slower. Position it accordingly. So right above my lamp. Like so. Simple as that. Then we have attenuation radius, which is basically how far does the light reach? If the radius is pretty small, you can see that the light gets cut off. So you want the radius to be, you know, as uh, as big as you need it to be. In this case, I think five meters will do the trick just I don't even need five meters probably, but uh, just in case I'll keep it. Last one is temperature. So I'll make the light just slightly warmer. That is not slightly warmer. Let's go for 4,400. Hmm, 4,600. 4,900? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right. Then, once this is done, I want to copy it onto my other surface right here. So I will choose the copy tool or duplicate tool, right? And mm, at this point, we probably want to... Um, yeah, I want to create a new layer and I'll just call it lights. Because all of my lights will live in that layer, so might as well. Like so. Right now it's not active, which is fine. I can actually right click. Uh, oh, we'll, we'll group it later. Uh, actually, yeah, we'll we'll group all of them later. So for now, let's let's keep them the, the way they are. Where was I copying, right? So the duplicate command. If I press that, I can duplicate the light source onto another surface, like so. Easy as that. So we have two of them, and I'll duplicate that one onto here, like that. I you know, I, I keep duplicating. Um, the command for duplicate, I believe it's D. I'm scared to use it though. Let's try D. Oh, uh, no, no, Control D. Shift D. Alt D. Alt D. Shift D. Oh, sh it, it was Shift D. Okay. Is it? No, it's Alt D. <laughs> uh, professional tutorial right here. Okay, it's Alt D to duplicate things. Alt D again. Alt D again. Now we're kind of now we're cooking. Now we have the lights shining where we want them to shine. Great. Um, also. It, 
while I'm at it. I could add more lights in here, but I don't think I need to. No, I will not shine the top here. Let's take a look in the, into the front view to see how they look like. Now you can see the lights are kind of blocking the view uh, of, of how it actually works. So I'm going to go to display and I'll turn off the light source uh, option or, or node right here. Tool set to tooltip. And I can see my lights there. Um, at this point, I will select all of my lights that I have and I will choose to right click and group them up. So I have a single group which is very nice to have because that, then I can turn all of them off at the same time. Right? So that's my, those are my lights. Then for them, I can increase or decrease their intensity. So let's say intensity 300. You can see them becoming brighter, more, more bright. Right? Okay. Uh, I accidentally locked one of them, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. All right. So we have all of these lights. Uh, I'm not sure if I need that heavy of in intensity here. So I'm going to keep it pretty low. Maybe the radius should also be pretty low. Or actually, let's, let's break it. Let's test it out. I'll test it out so that you don't have to. Intensity 2000. How does that look like? Looks pretty decent. At least I think it does. It does. Um, let's make it go fast. Oop, oop. A look at them. We're missing one light for some reason. Maybe we're not. Yes, we are. Where's what? Where is this light? Oh, it is here, but for some reason it's. Hmm. It's weird. It's being weird. Why is this light being weird? Let me ungroup. Select it. 2000. Pretty big attenuation, but for some reason gets ignored. Uh, okay. Try that again. Yep, they're shining. They're shining. Yeah, now they're not, now it's showing up. Okay, good, good. Got got me scared there for a second. So with the lights done, um, let's look at another variation of a light source, which is a spotlight. And for a spotlight, I will want to have some form of um, second. Mm, that's pretty boring. Let me just. something like that I'll want my uh, spotlight to hit my bonsai tree right here so here oh well, first of all let's let's add a bonsai tree right under models uh, I'll just type in bonsai I'll just find one there is no okay plants is it gonna be I'm, I'm going as fast as I can I promise okay broadleaf conifer amongst conifers did we see any bonsai amongst conifers I don't remember if we did I think all of them were pretty large. Uh, there are some that are oh, okay. Never mind. There are some that are smaller, but that is not good enough. 
Should I pause? I will pause. Uh, or rather, I will... Yeah, I'll pause. I'll pause. I found it. I found it. So it's apparently under accessories, potted greenery. There we go. Chinese style, mountain, stone, green, something, something. Let's load it in. And then we will put a spotlight on it. Whoa, that's huge. Okay, you're very, very big. You need to be smaller. Do we have a smaller? This is like a smaller version, isn't it? Or maybe we just scale it down? Question mark? Let's see if it scales down properly. Does that look natural? That looks fine, doesn't it? That rock, though, is uh, not, not great. Okay, so let's use something else. For instance, this one. Okay, this is much better in scale. Maybe even a little bit too small. So let me amp it up a bit. Something like that. And now let's find a pretty nice position for it. Close that, won't need that. Move it more like so. And then rotate it so that we can see the whole beauty of it. Zoom, zoom. Move it back. Oops, uh, that's the wrong. Okay, something like that. Okay, spotlight from here to here. You create a spotlight by choosing the spotlight tool. Mm, before I do that, just point light. If I want a point light, I just select it and add it wherever I want. The point light has exactly the same uh, parameters as what rectangular light has, except it's simplified, right? So nothing fancy about the point light. The spotlight right here, that has a few more uh, options and we will be working with those. So I'm just gonna add a spotlight somewhere here something like that and you can see immediately it creates this kind of a cone so we want that cone to be uh, accurate right uh, or to be kind of directed accurately at the bonsai so to do that we will uh, change the angle to be much much more narrow something like this maybe like that and you can change the IES values as well. IES is how the light is distributed, distributed uh, from the light source, right? So IES is mostly like a graph type of a thing. And you can see as I created an IES, it now is shining upwards. So I want to rotate it 180 degrees so, like that. Also, it's very bright. We'll need to fix that. Okay, so IS01, that's very uh, wide. Uh, let's find a much less wide IS value. Oh, this one shouldn't be rotated. Okay, so wideness doesn't matter. Wideness, we can just fix it. So I'll use IS102 or 02, 02, like that. Okay, let's position the light back onto one of these below these spotlights it doesn't really matter where it starts as long as if it starts inside of the geometry it will not shine right so that's that's an important notion to to understand and then i will rotate it along the x axis to direct it onto my onto my bonsai just like that right uh, cone angle 17.6 uh that actually looks pretty good so i'm gonna keep it the intensity is way too much uh, 100 50. okay and temperature could be warmer let's warm it up here 4700 should be fine visible in reflections yes source radius the larger the radius of the light source the sharper the or the softer the sh uh, shadow is gonna be if I remember correctly 
So we will have, oops, that's a one, that's a one. We'll have uh, 50 or 10 here for soft shadows. Okay. With this done, we have ourselves a spotlight, which kind of works. You can you can see your or our uh, bonsai tree now right there. It's messing up the light quite quite a bit. The, the glass, I mean, is messing up the light quite a bit. But hopefully, when we press the render button, it's gonna show up nicely. And I should show or hide the display of my light sources like that. Okay, let me recalibrate the light uh, because now it feels like it's a little bit too dull with the greenery here and you know all of the artificial lighting. So. I think we can get a, a nicer look here. Perhaps evening. Something like that. But the north is from there. Hmm, maybe. Typically I spend hours on this step, by the way, just trying to get that, that look. I think this is fine for, for what we're trying to do. This is fine. Uh, I might kind of do another pass at this once once I'm done with the tutorial. Um, now let's look at the, first of all, let me reset this. Let's look at the effects, all right? So under environment here, you also have the effects tab. If I enable this here, you have all of the effects that are associated with the view that you have selected. So I have my LUTs, for instance, I can apply for a desert LUT or modern dystopian action LUT or vibrance C LUT. Um, as you probably can see from here, oops, can see from here, uh, you don't want to apply any LUTs to your scene unless you know what you're doing. There are um, custom. Uh, there are LUTs that you can download from the internet, but most of them can be replicated here or in Photoshop, right? So you don't, don't. don't uh, short tutorial: Don't use LUTs. Ew, don't. Then here you have the old familiar exposure, all right? So you can tone down the exposure values if you want to. Um, you can increase the contrast that is decreasing that is increasing the contrast uh, you can play around with highlights so you can tone down the highlights or you can bump them up am I missing something or is it oh it's the sky so most of it goes into the sky in this case yeah so highlights, uh, I'll just have them at zero, have them bump, bumped down. For shadows, you can again brighten them up or tone them down even further. Up to you. Thinking of making this image a little bit flat. Something like that, 0 0.38. Then you have your slope, uh, which is basically how fast does the contrast increase, right? I, this is cinematic way of changing contrast, cinematic kind of color grading way. Uh, I would not mess with the slope and, and, uh, until you're more uh, familiar with shadows and highlights, right? And then working with these. Then we have white balance, which is, you want it more orange? Sure. You want it more blue? Sure. You have tint, which is either purple or green, right? So you can have it a little bit more orange and a little bit more green, for instance. Something like that. 
you have bloom which is basically the bright areas uh, become blurry um, over over brightened right so for bloom don't uh, don't have it too intense so anything above 0 0.5 i feel like is too much uh, but 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 is, is a healthy amount right so you have a little bit of glow going in there lens flare uh, that's the you can see the little flares that are happening in the camera right here uh, that those are also d directed by the light right the overly bright areas in the scene uh, so for the lens flare i usually have it in between 0 or 0 0.2 vignette is my favorite vignette adds uh, darkening around the perimeter of your scene which is a very um, well it's an accurate representation of what happens with older cameras right because of the curvature of the screen except that if you choose vignette one it's way too much right so you need to use like 0. 0.33 0 0.5 being the most i'll use 0 0.33 for this shot then we have chromatic aberration this one is actually trippy so chromatic aberration happens when red green blue channels are not um, in line in in the photograph this happens with cheap cameras or old and cheap cameras um photo Photo photographers uh, typically try to get rid of chromatic aberration while we as renderers we try to introduce it of course not to this extent so even chromatic aberration set to one is too much i would say 0 0.2 uh, 0 0.3 that's a healthy amount so almost not visible except for certain certain areas where it should be visible now you can see that I have toned down the colors quite a bit and I will bring it back up with saturation. Something like that. Not more than that. Then there's these styles that you can render out, the ambient occlusion style. That is very helpful when you're rendering out an additional pass that you will use to the get these kind of nooks and crannies into the like darkened nooks and crannies into your scene um, really makes the image pop better and then there's the z depth map which can be used to introduce fog like that and apply fog to your scene um, speaking of which in terms of the fog we can always introduce it let's go back to environment and turn on the fog Eesh. that's a lot of fog let's not have as much fog <laughs> so a height of the fog seems to be kind of okay actually maybe a little bit less something like that but the density is uh, no 0 0.2 should be good enough hmm I kind of liked it more when it was more foggy, 0 0.4. Let's keep a bit, a, a, a little bit, a healthy amount of it, right? So now we have our little house right here in the middle of the forest. Uh, the glass could be a bit darker, honestly. Yep. So I'm going to pick the glass and for the... Maybe I'll change the transparency this time, so I'll have it less transparent. Hello? There we go. That's way too much. 0 0.9. Hmm, 0 0.95. And then change the color. Instead of value 95, oops, we will use value of 92. Something like that. There we go. Then for specular, you can actually see here, when my specular highlights are at 1, all of the highlights from behind the, uh, the, the glass show up. Let me reduce the roughness so that you see better. So 
this is with zero roughness right so all of the specular highlights show up if my specular is set to zero neither one of them or neither of them show up so 0 0.2 ish 0 0.1 that should be kind of close to what i want then let's increase the roughness to 0 0.02 and with that, we are kind of there, kind of there. Yeah, composition-wise, I dig it. I think it looks good. I think it looks just good. So let's reset, or not reset, update. Sorry, update the scene. What am I saying? Reset. Look at the other angle. Okay, uh, that, that's good. <laughs> that, that's good. Uh, well, um, not there. That that needs some fixing, but maybe we can fix it. Like that. Just hide your crimes. Just keep hiding the crimes. Let's go back to here. Yep, that didn't mess anything up. Go back to here seems to be still working quite well those trees right there don't look that great let's actually turn on the fog uh what did i do 0 0.3 right or 0 0.4 0 0.15 yep something like this just to give it a little bit uh more breathing breathing room than as per usual, chromatic aberration 0 0.2, saturation a little bit higher, saturation, vignette uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.3, don't remember. I should check, but I won't. Mm, bloom, a bit more bloom. I kind of want the bloom in, in this one. Um, the white balance, a little bit warmer. Warm renders sell better by the way just just so you know warm renders people like warm tones okay something like this what if we increase the contrast here yeah, sure let's let's have it like that then back to our interior right so for the interior of course you need uh, furniture and furniture is what we're gonna introduce here what we're gonna be adding here this one is very out of place i feel like uh this metal bit needs to be uh not metal less metal or maybe we we have it metal maybe these need to be black as well and then maybe this is stone oh i know this is I'm starting to design, but uh, g give me a second. I will fast forward this portion where I'll just kind of design it a bit so that it's less, for the lack of a better word, less shit. <laughs> One second. Okay, so let's talk about auto saving. Thank God for auto saving in D5. Basically, under settings right here, under menu, preferences, under general, you can choose to, uh, you know, create a time interval for auto saving. And the default is 10 minutes, which is decent, which is fine. And then once you eventually do get a crash, especially if you're trying to record a tutorial, 
then you will need to open up your old file again but then you go to your menu file and then you click on view history version once you click that a menu will pop up right here on the uh, right hand side i will not be showing you that menu but it's going to be uh, basically a new menu which will show you every single uh, autosave that you've had and the oldest one that uh, or the newest one is always going to be newer than 10 minutes ago or no it's going to be in between 10 and 20 minutes i'm tired something around 10 minutes right uh, then you get your recovery you save the file and uh, you're good to go. So that's how auto saving works in D5. Let's talk about the renders or the, what you see here on the screen. I have added a few objects here. So now the scene looks a little bit more lively and I've changed a few effects here. So didn't touch the exposure, increase the contrast, change the highlights and shadows. So decrease the highlights, increased the brightness of the shadows reduced the contrast with the slope so wait i'm adding the contrast and i'm reducing the contrast well the slope reduces the contrast first in the in the shadows i believe yeah it's in the shadows so while this is much more global but basically these uh, settings i tuned them and they seem to be working okay then didn't touch the white balance or did i Maybe I did. Uh, check your numbers. If the number is a little bit different from yours, that means I did. Then we have the tent that was not touched. Bloom. I went full blast with Bloom because I want that top of the head of the sculpture to catch some light. I think that would look awesome. So I've added Bloom. Uh, you know, to, to get blurry. Then we have lens flares, we have ourselves a vignette and chromatic aberration, right? So all of these settings were changed here and this is how it looks like. You always want to have, um, how, do I, how do I say this? You want to have as many objects as possible in your scene, right? For it to look alive, you know, live them. Also, all of these objects are from the library, so uh, and you know how to get them in here, so I'm not gonna uh, explain it over and over and over again. Then here we have another scene. One thing about this scene is I have added. Oh, 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 come on, I have added a point light, which is right here. This little guy right here. And the reason why I've added a point light, let's go back to the scene. There we go, let me move it around so you can see it. The reason why I've added in the point light is because the uh, staircase was too dark. So I, I just needed the point. So I added the point light, uh, dropped down the intensity, and here we are. Right? Seems to be working quite well. Let's keep it at 10. Right. So it is done. Uh, let's take a look at the exterior. What was added there. I've added a tree right here. And some trees here to balance the heaviness of the building. Right. So we have a little bit more greenery going on here. Besides that, nothing has been changed. And the front view. Absolutely nothing has been changed. Okay. Okay. I will call it a day with this uh, with this tutorial with this project so we can or rather with this development <laughs> for this tutorial um, so we can move on and start rendering things exciting I will save I will save so uh, the render option is right here in the top you have image video or render queue well render queue is you basically add your images and videos into the render queue and then you push them out through the render queue uh, you render them out so in our image settings here when i click
click on image, you can see that now my shot is being framed according to a certain aspect ratio, according to a certain... Uh, we're not missing it? No, we're not. According to the uh, size, as well as our FOV and focal length. Right? Either this or this. Either FOV or focal length. So let me just kind of quickly guide you through. If you choose panorama view, uh, that means you're going to be rendering out something for virtual reality, right? Or, or for just kind of taking, looking around on a phone. You don't want that. So let me just go back to the image. Uh, we will not be touching upon that right now. Then for FOV, uh, we already have set up the FOV. I like to set up the FO, uh, field of view or focal length before I render. Uh, or before I press this kind of image render button so we don't need to change anything but if, if you do then you can change it right here zoom in zoom out do whatever right 72 then for aspect ratio we have either the aspect ratio of our window we can go 16 by 9 5 by 5 4 by 3 right or these presets so what I like doing is I like going for a preset of 4k and then making it uh, punching in a little bit more of a narrow view so or maybe no let, let's uh, render 4k because this feels like you can see these black bars here that they show what's gonna be trimmed away so I actually want to first render to just see if I need to move back a little bit to incorporate a little bit more of this grass and these rocks. Uh, should be fine though. Should be fine. Then we have the channels. <clears throat> By the way, they, these are the pixels, how many pixels you'll have. 4K is a pretty good uh, resolution. 6K is final production ready resolution. 8K, 16K is if you're planning on printing a full A1 sized render uh, or sheet. Then, uh, under channels, if I click uh, on this little, I don't know how to call it, like a slider icon here, I have all of these different channels that you can use. Sky Mask is basically, gives you a separate channel for, uh, all of these are for Photoshop, right? Sky Mask gives you the sky uh, as a separate channel. AO, Ambient Occlusion, gives you, um, the nooks and the crannies i already showed you ao with uh, the effects tab right here that's the ambient occlusion map those are basically shadows that make your image punch better punch more uh, then you have material id so different material materials in different colors reflections transparency and z depth z depth is already i've shown you this how far things are away from the camera okay so all of these channels i want them i i want to keep them uh we will keep them okay that's done um we have one of these images kind of set up ready to go i will click on the add to render cube button right here uh, do you see my mouse you see my mouse my mouse moves to the right and down render cube add to render cube there's also cancel and the render you can straight up re start rendering this, rendering this, but I will be adding it to render queue because I want to set up all four of the renders and render them out all at once. So that, bam. Uh, once I've clicked that, you can see my render queue has a little dot there. If I look at it, here's my image that's ready to be rendered. You can see that it's uh, set up so that it's rendering out a PNG file. That's normal, that's fine. We can use that. Let's go to two-thirds render. Uh, don't really want to change anything here, so I'll just add it to render queue. 24. Um, don't really like that. That's unfortunate. Perhaps we can... Oops, sorry. Uh, perhaps we can, while we're still in this view, Come on, 
go down not that much it's very annoying okay display smooth display and then here flying much less flying Let's try again okay that's gonna catch looking up mm, something like that i mean mm. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, sorry for uh, doing this now, uh, but I I do want it to be pretty. <laughs> anyway, now the strawberries are actually in frame. Should be o an okay render. We will probably not see any roof with this though. It is what it is. Okay, uh, I could, by the way, change the focal length of the lens and maybe I will. Uh, so let's just change the focal length to instead of 39 uh, 35 degrees eh. actually we could go 33 oh not degrees sorry millimeters 33 millimeters and then punch in a little bit more something like that uh, don't forget if you're changing something update the scene here that's important and now I promise <laughs> add the render queue we move on we move on what about this again same problem with the teapot that's not showing uh, let's punch out 33 mil camera well actually that looks pretty decent uh, so I'm gonna maybe do oops 24 mil camera something like that very wide would that look pretty good Mm, maybe that's too much 26 28 yeah something like 28 seems to be doing just fine reset or update the scene hit that render or hit that add to render queue button now we go in here and we will start rendering so uh, and by go in here I mean click on the render queue button right here we have our all of our images ready to go so for the location i will just choose a new folder called output like that and here i'll just create a new one images typically i do like Right now I'm recording this on March 22nd, so 0322 images. I like using date at the start. Select folder. There we go. That's where they are uh, going to be recorded or rendered out. Uh, all of the images need to be selected. So here we select all of the images or you can do that manually by just clicking on each of them. But the tick mark does need to be there. Right. So you're saying that I'm going to be rendering these. Uh, one final save. Now I'm, I'm very paranoid. One final save. Back in here and then you click render. Oh, it saves, <laughs> saves it for you. So it knows, it knows. Okay, so this is calculating. It's gonna be rendering for me. I'm gonna uh, definitely pause the video because it's, I mean, it, it's gonna take a little bit of time. And once that is done, we're going to do a little bit of Photoshop work with these images. Once those are done, we will start talking about animations and how you can record different animations, which is exciting. Yay, it's done, it's done. Okay, so let me show you what it did. So here we have all of the renders and you, as you can see, we have all of these different uh, layers or channels as they are called. So in Photoshop, I'll, I'll just grab the, that one as well but that one is just z depth is just white we don't care about z depth okay so I'll grab all of these and just drag them over to photoshop and show you how i typically work with them and also we'll just take a look at the quality that we get this is at a hundred percent as you can see the quality has increased when we once we rendered it out 
we don't have any more weird artifacts of real-time preview and it's in general much more accurate so i kind of enjoyed this uh, render now actually now it's it's kind of nice so here's the ambient occlusion map right and the way i take it and paste it here ctrl c ctrl v and the way i use it sorry not take it and paste it here what do I, what am i saying the way i use it is as a multiply map right and you can see that uh, if by default i just use it as multiply like so it becomes very bad also why is that so blue oh that's chromatic aberration so i wasn't careful with chromatic aberration here you can now clearly see how uh, chromatic aberration kind of messes up the image so that's bad uh, i would probably re-render this also the top is being cut off that is also not good i most likely will re-render this later for for the final images that that i'll show but uh, before i forget let's do it this way yeah, yeah that's that's a problem and also reduce the chromatic aberration so under effects that 0 0.05 something closer to this and we just need to raise our camera so tricky with this or actually we can do uh, a cheeky thing here and go down with the camera to what it's one once was that nope down we said down yep something like that and reset like that okay now i at least i know that uh, i will not forget the next time i render this this will be clean so back in here uh, that multiply layer you can see it darkens everything way too much so what i need to do is i need to go back in here and actually raise the white uh, values by quite a bit the brightness values by quite a bit so that only certain areas here are darker so i'm going to raise it perhaps something like that overall brightness raise that yeah so Here. let me zoom in to the trees in the back without with let me increase this 33 percent they pop when it's turned on this is turned on this is turned off when it's turned on they pop a little bit more right that's all we needed from this 33 uh, percent ambient occlusion does the trick right it's just fine okay then here we have all of our different um, colors of control c control v if i take this and i um, add it in here and let's say i want to i don't know what do we want to do terrace maybe we want to darken the terrace the terrace is a little bit too bright uh, i will take this color by going to select color range and clicking on the color uh, fuzziness can be pretty low so five mm. 
Fuzzina shouldn't be that low. So not 5. Select color range. Um, try... What was it? 15? Something like that? Mm. Why? Every time I try to record a tutorial. <laughs> Come on. That? Okay, it's not catching it. Now it's catching it. So holding down the shift key, you can pick up more than one type of a pixel uh, or m more than one type of a color. Uh, in this case, it seems like there are two oranges in the planks. So I just picked up both of them and you can see it. Eh, I mean, it's doing it, but not doing it great. So I'll just go to filter. Uh, where was it? Not filter, sorry, select and there should be like grow. Yeah, grow selection. So I'll grow the selection to get more of it, minimize that, go back in here and then just do Ctrl L and darken my planks that way, just slightly. And now they're darker, right? So with color sel uh, picking tool, select color range with color range tool you can pick any any object in the scene that shares the same material uh, just make sure that uh, apparently the fuzziness does need to be pretty big that was uh, me trying to lie to you i am sorry so now for instance this one Control l and i will just brighten this up just slightly like that right uh, the blurriness, oh yeah, uh, one thing to note is be careful with uh, out of focus elements, those don't transfer, right? So the blurriness is gonna look funky if you uh, use the material selection with, the, with a blurry portion of the image. Okay, next up uh, we have reflections. So if you want to increase the reflections, you can again copy paste them in here and here you can use what's called an add uh, addition linear dodge and in doing so you you can see how much these reflections are slapped in there add it in right again doesn't work with blurriness so be careful um in my case do i need any of these let me just check not really not really so well actually Maybe the grass, but the grass even without this is al already pretty highlighty, so I'm not gonna use that. Then we have the sky mask, and this one is quite useful, so I can use the sky mask right here as a. As a and let me just show you real quick. So you create a new layer, and I like to color just color that layer red, just pure red. And for that layer, I create a mask, uh, this icon right here, bottom right, add layer mask, right? I select the mask, I go to channels and I enable layer six mask. So in here, I'm, I'm now going to be drawing the mask, but not really. I'm going to be copy pasting in the mask, just like that. Then I disable the preview of it, go back to layers and here now, I have my cropped out um, sky, right? With which I can, uh, well, instead of red, I can use whatever I want, you know, and I can just add my information on top of the sky. Then I would probably do something like either like change the opacity a little bit, basically play around and just find uh, some sort of a sky image that fits well and bash them together this way of course now i have it red so it doesn't look that great but if i just go for let's see some darker blue like that now i'm able to darken my sky quite quickly without any issues and one thing that i do like to do is create a gradient higher up so that the horizon is still pretty bright right so that's uh, how i work with layers and also oh my god this is the chromatic aberration is just destroying us <laughs> right now 
uh, let's take a look at other renders without the Photoshop part. Uh, just just to kind of take a look at how they uh, got rendered out. So uh, two interiors and one exterior. I just see. What? Okay, let's close these, I guess. Oh my god, stop. Stop. Please, I'm trying to record the freaking video. It decided that it wants to save. Well, it didn't decide. I, I misclicked. And now, now it's saving. Okay. Windows just crashed. That's great. Uh, one second. I found them. And not just that I found them, I also have photoshopped them. So now we have a new little render here with the roof being in the correct position and less of um, chromatic aberration going on. But one thing that I have re-added is this uh, ambient occlusion, but this time I have softened it by quite a bit. And I've softened it by just taking levels for the AO channel and moving the levels very close to the black range right here and moving the darkest possible color into this kind of gray right so that's creating this layer and then being able to use multiply to you know introduce a little bit more uh, three-dimensionality into my scene again pops a little bit more so now i'm happy with this i will be saving this uh, then we have ourselves this facade i think this is successful i didn't need to change anything about the facade itself it's pretty good the glare from the now we can actually talk about the glare that's the glare <laughs> Right, the glare from the lamps is a little bit too much uh, for me, but hey, it is what it is. I, I think at least it catches the attention, it catches the eye. There are two things that I have added here. Uh, both of them are sky related. First one, and both of them, these are direct copies of one another. So this is literally just a sky uh, map channel with a white color on it, right? So that's, this is pure white color, and this is sky channel, right? So normal uh, with opacity of 100, oh, sorry, normal with opacity of 54 uh, to just brighten up the sky. This is without, this is with. And then another one, 54% with saturation to make the sky less blue. As easy as that. So now we have ourselves a little bit of a, you know, grayish uh, Scandinavian sky and a pretty cold render altogether. If you want to uh, warm up your render here, it's a little bit trickier in Photoshop. Uh, typically, you could use photo filter and use a warming filter on it. Definitely not on that, on the main one. Adjustments, photo filter. So that's being warmed right now. I can uh, choose LBA warming. Maybe that's gonna be better with higher density. Hmm. So that's without, that's with, without, with. But it's better to use uh, like proper, um, how is it called? Color balance, color balance in, uh, or no, temperature balance. Oh my God words white balance white balance in your um, d5 render back in here i will keep it i think with 20 or 16 density uh, just to have it a little bit warmer then here not much has been changed i have increased the contrast just slightly for this scene and i have also added ambient occlusion already you already know how this is done one thing though is I've, I'm using a map for ambient occlusion that is the 
transparency map. I can show it to you here. No, not here. Uh, perhaps like that. Yeah, there we go. Transparency map that is also baked out together with uh, all of the different uh, other channels. So transparency map um, basically maps out where all of the uh, transparent objects are, right? And those should not receive ambient occlusion, right? So I'm just using that as a map for my overall ambient occlusion channel. Again, pops just a little bit more. I like it. Next, this one. I think this one is uh, quite successful. The I'm not sure, not so sure about the light shining upwards on this particular wall. Maybe that's a little bit too much. But besides that, it's a pretty good render. So in here we have, uh, this one is an empty layer, sorry. In here we have exactly the same thing as in our previous um, 3D render of this interior, right? Okay, so those are the four renders that I've made. I will be saving them, but before I do that, uh, let me show you video rendering and this is going to be the last bit and we will end with the video rendering so video rendering is done by clicking the video rendering icon on the top right corner right there and here what you're doing is you're basically creating uh, keyframes moments in the scene for where i should move myself here in this case there we go, uh, for where the camera should be at any given stage. So now with video uh, mode turned on, I can create a new clip or rather we, we already have a clip here, but I will rename it to my uh, exterior, let's say exterior clip and I can add the camera just like that right so it grabs whatever is in the screen <coughs> sorry it grabs whatever is in the screen currently what I'm looking at and creates a camera from it which means I can just easily move the camera forward like that and add another camera right so now we have two of them now if I press play well it's lagging like crazy because I'm recording as well but this is the animation that is going to be played again and add another um, or actually let me do that let me go to camera 2 and let's move, um, let's look over to the right, like that. Also. under camera under camera sorry uh, I look to the right and under camera I change the FOV to something that is a little bit more a little bit more intense and I add the camera right so it's not just the Display, smooth display, back to here, or you're gonna need to bear with me. So we're zooming in, and now we're gonna whoop, zoom in with the camera, right? So you can change the camera settings. 
you can change the exposure values you can change everything here you can also change the environment uh, lighting right so for instance let's say um, which is here I will make my lighting go from here something like that don't forget to click on the uh, refresh button to to kind of re, re not refresh reinstate the camera and then as i press play you can see that the light changes nice huh so you can control the uh, the sun as well in your animations uh, the uh, speed at which things move is controlled by these little doodads here in between the keyframes. You can see that it's 6 seconds right now. I can increase this to 10 seconds. And the next one can be 12 seconds or whatever. right? Or I can decrease this to 3 seconds and 2 seconds to make it much faster. Um, I don't want camera 3 in this case, so I'm going to remove it. I'm going to keep it camera 1 and camera 2, just like that. I think that's that's good enough. And here for the transition, I'm going to use 10, 10 seconds. So a very small or, or very short video. Uh, exactly the same thing with the interior scene. I will not be repeating that. Uh, or rather maybe maybe we should so <laughs> sorry <laughs> so let's uh, create a new clip here create clip and let's call this clip interior right interior jump to scene 24 and do something 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 like so quick and dirty way just works uh, so there, there's no need to so here we have it seems to work seems to work quite well uh, we might want to change the light conditions for instance so for this I will actually do a precise preview quality so let's say we start with this kind of light condition and for camera 2, our light uh, I hoped there's gonna be more of a change. <laughs> Don't forget to reset uh, the, the, the camera. And now let's take a look. It's gonna lag like crazy, but you can see the light changing position as we're moving, which is nice. That is what we want. Okay, we have two, uh, two clips ready to go. Now uh, I will change the resolution of the clips of course. So here on the right hand side you have your resolution and you have your format. Uh, typically you want the format to be mp4. I, I believe, yeah, sorry, that's the only format. So you're stuck with it. mp4 is great. Uh, you don't need to change it. The resolution for the video, either 4k, 2k or 1080p or 720p. 720p. Um, I would 
argue that 4K is a little bit of an overkill for this type of a render, en uh, render engine. So let's do 2K for this. Uh, frame rate, so how fast do you want, how smooth do you want the frames to be? Uh, I'll just do or the animation to be. Uh, with 30 frames per second, it's gonna look a little bit more cinematic because cinema uses 24. Uh, I hope I'm not lying. Yes, they use 24 frames per second. Uh, so that's done. Don't forget to go back to your exterior and change the, uh, make sure that exterior output is also changed. It seems like these translate, so that's great. Once this is done, <coughs> Click on add to render queue, bam, check the render queue and notice that only the exterior render has been added. That's important, right? So you do need to add every single clip, right? So you select the second clip of interior, add to render queue. Now you see both of them, you can tick mark them and you can start rendering. Except that I'm gonna, for output, I'm gonna choose Movies, new folder, movies. Actually, let me borrow this. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to render this out. And once this is done, unpause the video as per usual. There we go. It's done. We're finally done with the course. So we have four still images and two animations going and the two animations rendering those out took one and a half hours. So 20 seconds, uh, one and a half, uh, took one and a half hours to render out on a RTX 3080 graphics card. And the four images, each of them took like a minute. So the still images are very fast. The animations are not that fast, but considering the alternative, even the animations are pretty damn, pretty damn fast. Let's take a look at the quality of them. Alright, so right off the bat, I can see the uh, problem that every one of these real-time render engines has. And that problem is called uh, the, the shimmering of um, high-frequency detail. So when we look at the this area right here, and I really hope that it's gonna show up in the with the YouTube compression and whatnot, and this area right here does shimmer as the light conditions change and not just that also just when the camera shifts perspective there is this kind of a over sharpness going on here also there are areas where uh, never mind i i wanted to say that anti-aliasing which is like the softening of diagonal lines um that that is kind of messing up but not really it's mostly my, my problem is with how the shimmering works. Clearly, when dealing with animations, you will lose a little bit of quality compared to still images, but do I consider this to be still a usable animation to show to a client? Yes, I do. There are certain parts that I would kind of take a second pass at, of course, but all in all, I think it conveys the concept the idea quite well add some uh, post processing in the video editing software add some uh, uh, the sound and it's gonna gonna be great also some interior lighting wouldn't wouldn't hurt okay then we have some interior shots or one interior shot uh, this one is actually even worse in terms of the shimmering in terms of the shimmering effect. You can see the glass, beca be probably because of the refraction, the glass is struggling a little bit to show the full uh, range, not range, don't know how to call it, um, resolution, I guess, of the leaves, or to calculate the leaves properly. So there is a lot of this noisiness going on in the backdrop. But besides that, I feel like this is a pretty good shot. Let's compare it to the still images that we have. Also, that area right there really needs some love and unfortunately I didn't give it. <laughs> um, 
comparing it to still shots uh, which one this one clearly my uh, render here a still image render here has already been adjusted amended uh, to you know the brightness and contrast have been dialed in while this one is still highly contrasting uh, some people like high contrast images i personally don't like them as much i prefer this kind of a you might say washed out uh, style but all in all i think the quality between these two is comparable at least well okay maybe not so uh, it's comparable to a certain extent here again uh, that chromatic aberration if you need to pick up one thing from this course uh, don't use chromatic aberration or if you're using it don't use it like i do use it much less um, and then compared to here I'm, I'm now looking at the wood grain texture yep uh the materi materials at least are very similar very very close to each other so i'm, I'm pretty happy with, with the outputs that we've gotten uh we have successfully made four um, renders still images two animations that was the goal of the course which means that the course is finished do i suggest um using uh, d5 for animations yes i think compared to the competitors only um, non-real-time render engines beat d5 uh, render engines such as corona or v-ray or uh, i'm blanking redshift and so on all, all of those they of course they, they beat d5 in quality but at, in speed <coughs> d5 clearly is the winner and compared to other real-time render engines d5 is uh, pretty good pretty good so if you need uh, to render out animations use d5 if you need to render out still images use d5 <laughs> okay enough enough blabbing if you want to get all of the files including the final scene uh, that i have created during this course Again, consider supporting the channel uh, by being a Patreon supporter. Link in the video description. If you just appreciate me helping out, hopefully, really hopefully, helping out people learn these softwares, then you can support by subscribing or liking the video or leaving a nice comment. I read the comments. I reply to the comments. I love the comments. If they're not mean. Okay. <laughs> Enough. Bye. Bye.